Well, thank you for joining us for Almost Persuaded. My name is Alan Hall, and I'm the pastor of Good News Free Will Baptist Church in York, Pennsylvania. If you have your Bibles today, if you'll turn to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 24, we're going to be reading the first several verses there and then making some references to some other verses here uh, throughout the chapter. I'd like to speak to you today on the subject of, Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 1. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words, and returned from the sepulcher, and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, and Joanna, and Mary the mother of James, and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulcher, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. You know, the Bible is filled with statements about the morning. You know, I think uh, several times in the New Testament here, we find references of, it talks about Jesus praying early in the morning where he got away from the crowds and his disciples and just got away alone with he and his father and prayed there early in the morning. Joshua in the Old Testament is pictured as a man who rose up early in the morning. I think about that morning when Abraham woke up his son Isaac and they gathered up their things there and he took them up on the mountain, Mount Moriah, uh, to sacrifice his son as God was using that to test uh, Abraham's faith and Abraham's love for him. Uh, that was early in the morning. Uh, I think about what a morning it was for Jacob when he got up that uh, after awakening from his sleep and his dream and he, and he erected there a pillar of stones in, in honor of God. It must have been a glorious morning for Daniel to wake up after spending a night in, with the lions then. Uh, you know, they, they on, on all accounts, should have ripped him apart. They should have devoured him. But you remember, God shut their jaws. Daniel was faithful, you remember. And God honored his faithfulness. And, of course, that must have been a welcoming sight that next day when Daniel got to see the sun shining again. Imagine how beautiful the morning was for the disciples after, after they spent that terrible stormy night on the Sea of Galilee. But, you know, all these mornings were great mornings. But none of these mornings could compare to the one that we find in the passage before us. There was, there's never been a morning like that one, nor there ever will be a morning like that one. Oh, what a morning it was when Jesus rose again. And oh, what a morning it was when he defeated death and, and, and gave eternal life to all those that will put their faith in him. Now, there's something that we've got to understand here. The resurrection of the Lord uh, had great effects during the time that it happened. But do you realize that those effects still reach down to this very day, to the day in which we live? He is alive today. Uh, he came back to life then, but he is alive today. And, and over the next few moments, I just want to, I want us to think about that beautiful first resurrection morning. First of all, it was a morning of solemn reflections. Look back in verse 1 of our text. It says, Now upon the first day of the week, that's Sunday, very early in the morning they came into the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. As the morning began the dawn on that first day of the week after Jesus died here, the scripture tells us that a few women 
gathered themselves together to bring spices to this tomb. They were there for the main purpose of to uh, complete the preparation uh, of the body for burial. It, you remember it had already started uh, several days earlier when Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea had taken Jesus' body down off the cross and they had laid his body in a borrowed tomb. It was Joseph's tomb. And, and they laid him in there and they began that preparation process of wrapping the body, but the women came back to finish up that process. It had to be a sad time for them. Their emotions must have been, they must have been so distraught and so discouraged, and they, they missed him so. But then we find the disciples. The disciples were held up in an upper room. You remember what had happened when they came to take Jesus uh, away to be crucified? They arrested him there in the Garden of Gethsemane. They all scattered. They all fled. Now we get on Peter for denying Christ, but do you realize all the disciples denied him? All of them fled and act like they didn't know him. And so they were up in the upper room thinking, wow, if they crucified Jesus and we're his close followers, I mean, we're his disciples, then they could do the same thing to us that they did to Jesus and we don't want to be crucified. And so maybe if we'll hide, they can't find us. And so they scattered, and they hid, and they cowered in the corner. And so basically what had happened was a fulfillment of what Jesus said would happen. He said the shepherd would be smitten, and the sheep would be scattered. He, the great shepherd, was smitten, and his sheep did scatter. They fled. They were in fear. They had all believed that Jesus was the Messiah. There was no doubt about that. Jesus had asked the disciples some days earlier, He says, Who do men say that I am? And they told Him all the answers that people had come up with. But then He says, Who do you say that I am? And of course, they answered that question correctly. He was the Messiah, the Son of God. They believed that. They had expected Him to be their, their king, and, and, and they had expected Him not only to be their king, but to set up His kingdom here on earth to overthrow the Roman government. Oh, they had big plans for Jesus. They had big plans for themselves that they would rule with Him. But even though Jesus had told them about the cross, He had told them about the resurrection, they still had not put those pieces of the puzzle together. It, they, they still couldn't quite grasp the meaning of His words. And now He was dead. And now what would they do? I mean, they had left all to follow Him. I mean, would they go back and continue to do what they used to do those some three, three years plus before? I mean, what, what would they do now? I mean, Jesus was dead, the one who had, they had placed all their hope in, the one who had radically changed their lives by His power and had demonstrated what love truly is. He had died a very violent and very humiliating death. Surely it was a sad day for them. And you know, even though I can't fully comprehend their sadness on that day, I, I can at least understand part of it. Because I understand what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He tells us that if Jesus were dead, if He was dead today, then you know what that means for us? That means that we're still on our way to hell. That means there is no hope to ever have forgiveness of our sins. That means there is no way that we could enter into a wonderful place called heaven one day. I mean, if Jesus is dead, none of those things are possible. There's no hope for us beyond this life, and there's no hope for us in this life. We are, like Paul said, we are most miserable. It was a morning of solemn reflections. Number two, it was a morning of startling revelations. In the midst of their sadness, God the Father looked down upon them and their sadness, and He cared for them. And He took great pains to minister to the needs of their hearts, what they were going through. You know, I'm so glad that our Heavenly Father does the same thing for us. And when we go through hurts, He ministers to those hurts. He cares about what we go through. I don't, I don't know what you've been through in your life, but He cares what you're going through. And He wants to help you with that hurt. He wants to help heal that hurt in your life. Notice several things He did to encourage 
these women and, and these disciples to encourage their hearts. First of all, he rolled the stone away from the tomb. Back in verse 2 it says, And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. Now I want us to understand something here. The reason that the stone was rolled away from the tomb was not so that Jesus could get out. I mean, he didn't come back to life on the inside and was knocking on the other side of the tomb and saying, let me out of here. That's not why the tomb stone was rolled away. The reason it was rolled away it was so that the people on the outside, his followers, those who would be coming by the tomb could look in and see he's not there. He had risen. Oh, how that it had to encourage their heart when they saw that. Not only that, but he sent an angelic messenger with a great message. Look back in verse 4. It says, And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. These were angels. And as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? What a great message! He is not here, but is risen. No other message could ever compare to that. I submit to you today that that's a greater message than He's born in Bethlehem. I submit that that's an even greater message than He died on a cross for you and me. The fact that He rose from the dead, what a wonderful message. And, 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 and it reverberated during uh, that time and it reverberates through the halls of time even today and throughout eternity. He is alive and alive forevermore. He had an encouraging uh, word for Peter. Remember Peter denied him three times? I love how Scripture records this. In Mark chapter 16, verse 7, the angel said to them, he said, But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter. God singled out Peter. Peter is probably more distraught than anybody. He's probably more discouraged than anybody. He's over in the corner of the upper room with his head in his hands saying, God will never use me again. God will never love me again. I turn my back on his precious son. Go to the disciples. Tell them, but also tell Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. In other words, I'm going to be there to meet them. I'm, uh, Jesus is going to go ahead and he's going to wait for them in Galilee so when the disciples get there and Peter gets there, then he can welcome them, all those that denied him, all those that turned their back on him, he can welcome them back to himself and let them know, I still love you. I still care about you. He met Mary Magdalene outside the tomb. You can read about that meeting in John chapter 20. Mary Magdalene cared for him with all her heart, and God rewarded that love that she displayed toward Jesus by having a special meeting with her in the garden. Number five, he left a message for his followers inside the tomb. John chapter 20, if you'll turn over there, we'll see this very special message. John chapter 20, and look in verse 5. And he stooping down and looked in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. John and Peter went running to the tomb that morning after the women went back and told them that the tomb was empty. They went running there, but John wouldn't go in. Why didn't John go in? Because it's a graveyard, it's not well lighted, and there's a body missing. That's why he didn't go in. Kind of spooky. And so he didn't go in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie. So he sees Jesus' clothes laying over here on the side, but he also sees something else. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Now what's so significant about that? Well, this is a message that the disciples would have understood. You see, there was an oriental custom that when a man with his servants was eating a meal, he would use his napkin to signal them during the course of that meal. If he would leave the table and he would wad up that napkin, maybe throw it on the table or on his plate, then it meant that he was finished uh, and he wouldn't be coming back. But if he took that napkin and he neatly folded that napkin, maybe laying it beside his plate or in his chair, then it told his servants that he was just stepping away for a little while, but he would be back. 
Now, what did Jesus do with this napkin that was about his head? He folded it. He put it in a place by itself. You know what he was telling these disciples? I'm going to be out of your sight for a little while, but I'll be back. Oh, and how that had to encourage their hearts to know that Jesus was going to be away from them a little while. Oh, and they missed him so, but he was going to come back for them. You know what? He, he told them the same thing. When he ascended from this earth up into the clouds to be with his heavenly Father, uh, the angel spoke to them and says, Look, he that's going up this way is going to come back in, in like manner. He's coming back for you. And several passages in the New Testament tells us that Jesus is coming back. Doesn't that encourage your heart today to know that Jesus is coming back for us one day? And then in Luke chapter 24 and verses 13 through 35, we read how Jesus revealed himself to the disciples on the road to, Dema uh, on the road to Emmaus. And there was many other things that took place on that resurrection morning that marked it as a great and glorious morning. For us, 2,000 years removed from the resurrection, the message has not changed one bit. We still need to hear the good news that Jesus has risen from the dead. He is alive today and there is hope for us tomorrow. That person who is trapped in sin today, that may be listening to this message, I want you to know you may not see an avenue or of escape, but there is an avenue. There is a way to escape from that sin because Jesus has come. He's died for you. He's rose again. He, he rose again.